About two, two and a half hours, trying to build up the courage to walk out back to the race shop to meet my dad for the first time. Here comes this truck pulls in. Just get in the truck. And I'm, dad. Aunt Kay and my Aunt Kathy. Now I'm kind of wanting to know more. Well, I don't think this video really needs much of an introduction. <laughs> what yeah, are we I mean, doing here? <laughs> hey, I'm Carrie Earnhardt. Oh, you remember me? <laughs> <laughs> We're heading out to my hometown where I grew up. It's a little place called Enotville, North Carolina. It's in Kannapolis. I'm gonna give you my little history of my life growing up. You know, there's really not that much information about you prior to like racing late models and stuff. Like I think the youngest picture of you I can find on Google, you already had a mustache. Yep. <laughs> yep. There wasn't a lot out there. I, I put some out with a couple people and uh, did the dirty mo download with Dell Jr. And uh, I did something with Claire B. Lane years and years ago on XM Radio. Really never told my life story outside of that. Claire B. was the most in depth I've ever got. They aired it and it had a lot of good reviews, so must have done something right. And now we get to see where those stories took yes, place. Yes, no one got to see these. So this is when you were growing up as Carrie Key. Yes, this is, this is when I was Carrie Key. So, you know, my, my mom and dad separated when I was about two, two and a half years old. And then my mom met this other guy named Jack Key and they dated and got married and he adopted me when I was three and a half, four years old. So I grew up as Kerry Key. Um, didn't really know much about my dad and all that stuff. So this is a little area where I rode bicycles around all the time. I had a buddy I went to high school with, lived back there, and we worked on little Porsches and Volkswagens, kind of tuned them up and did some Baja buggies out of a couple of them. Had a little track in his backyard we raced around a lot. All this area right here is where I rode bicycles around and tormented the neighbors and the people around here. <laughs> cut through their yards a lot of times and got yelled at. And remember, this is many, many years ago, so a lot has changed since then. So this is the home from the time I remember growing up. This is the first home I remember. We had a house before this, but I think I was four or five years old when we moved into the trailer park. What year was this? Man, roughly? don't ask me that. Wait, you were born I'm, with 69? I was born 69, so 74 or 5. So this big tree we're coming up on here, the little trailer that's got the brown big stripe on it, that's where I grew up. Is it the same one? That's the same one, the same trailer. Did it have A lot it? older, and that, that little addition on the backside wasn't there. A lot older and a little dirtier than it used to be. So that's where we grew up. And this field across the road is where we run around playing ball and throwing frisbees and everything like that. Ride the school bus and we'd come through here and drop kids off. And I had to stay on the bus and go to what used to be Peter Pan daycare, which I really loved because of people that run up Pete and Marie Walker were super nice people and it's all gone now but this used to be all playground and it went way back up to the other road over there the house used to be right here that we would go and have lunch and snacks and everything it had a big basement and there was some I don't know it's like a modular home there now but this was the old fence that we used to do work in the front yard me and a couple of boys would rake yard and mow the grass and everything and one time we was out there raking yard and had watermelon and this van come by and we decided we we're gonna throw a ride at the van <laughs> and get away with it. Well I hit the van and next thing I know it slams on brakes and puts in reverse and we take off running and they had this huge <laughs> tractor tire on the playground. Of course I jump inside of it and hide inside the tire, me and another buddy of mine, Danny Horton. We ran in there and then my now he's married to my cousin, Sonny Lunchford, he went to another location, I don't forgot where he went, but he went and hid. Had a lot of good times, a lot of whippings, <laughs> hickory switches. Were you under the impression that Jack was your dad? Yeah, yeah, he was my age? dad, and, and he, you know, I had a great life. We we fished, he took me fishing a lot. He loved golf, so you know, we got to play golf a little bit, hitting golf balls and stuff, and as I got older up in high school, he got, he ran, he, leased land and it was a driving range for you know hit golf balls so i worked there after i get off of high school this is a route we took on our bus route this used to be all nothing but a dirt field with ruts we'd ride motorcycles at 
Oh, this right here. And back side of my mom's house that I talked them into binds over here. Well, I'm getting to. So we'd ride the bus around through here, and we I was always wanting to get out of the trailer because, you know, I just didn't like trailers. I didn't feel safe in a trailer. Another neat story. There's a lake right down there. I don't know if you'll be able to see it back in there. Yeah, yeah. back in there. It's Canapolis Lake. So this house right here with the red car is the house we drove by every time on the school bus, and it had a for sale sign in it, front yard. And I kept talking to Mama about buying a house, buying a house, moving out of the trailer, and I told her about this house for sale. So she got with the realtor, and we come up here, and we looked at it, and her and my dad, Jack, bought it. So we moved from the trailer park to a brick house. Huh. We actually had a home now. How old were you when that happened? I think I was six, seven years old, six years old. Did you have your own bedroom? Yes, I had my own bedroom, and it was this corner bedroom right here. The corner window, that was my bedroom, and the window beside it, next to the front door, was my sister, uh, Janine Key, JJ is what we call her. J JJ was short for Janet Janine, because I couldn't say Janet Janine. <laughs> and so she stayed in that bedroom, and then that back corner was my mom and dad Jack's bedroom, and the front is the living room. And so since then, my mom's passed away, um, about three years ago, and they sold the house and they got new people living there now. So she lived there a little, a little Oh, time. I, I went through high school, everything living there. I actually moved out of there, got married in the first try. So I was 18, 18 years old when I moved out. So yeah, I lived there till I was 18. And a lot of fun. Story back to that lake. We moved into here. I didn't realize the lake was right here about 150 yards away from the house. So I would come in and either go through these woods right here or go down to that house with the red uh, Suburban down there and sneak in behind there. I was a buddy of mine that I went to school with. We'd sneak in down through there and go down to the little cove that come back off the lake and go down there fishing. And there was no fishing there. There was no trespassing. So we'd always get chased. We'd see the plane fly over and they have a little light on the bottom plane they'd turn on when they was above us and here come a boat with the game warden coming down through here, or security guy, what I call him. <laughs> they called him Tiny, but he was probably 350 pounds, so <laughs> all he could do is drive a boat, he couldn't run. <laughs> so we knew we had it pretty easy with him, so we'd always run away and get, get away from it. But we caught a lot of fish there. And one time, there was about five of us down there fishing. There was a little place you could cross the cove down there. You walk across about knee deep. And I had walked across, me and a buddy of mine named James Robinette, walked across and a couple other guys down here, Jeff Treese, a real good friend of mine, and uh, his cousin Chad were on this side, and another friend of theirs stayed on this side. The plane come over, and it's like, oh man, we gotta go. Well, Jeff Treese lived in that direction, so him and Chad come across the cove, went up through the woods towards their house, and I was gonna walk down the back of the cove and come out way down about three more houses down past that red suburban. So I get away. Well, we was walking down through there, me and James, and he was behind me, and I seen this guy squatted behind the tree. I said, hey, how you doing? I seen the badge, and he was a police officer. It's <laughs> like, James, run. So I turned around and ran right into James. And the next thing I know, there's three cops on us. So we got caught, finally. <laughs> and I was 15 years old then, about to turn 16. And so we got hauled out. They actually took us out to the way James and them went. First, they handcuffed me and James around a pine tree. I was on one side, he was on the other, and they handcuffed us. And the officer that sat with us, it was his last week, and I kept trying to talk him into letting us go, and he wouldn't do it. I was like, tell him we escaped or something. I don't know. But he wouldn't let us go, so he ended up taking us out, putting us in the police car, and carrying us to the police department. My mom worked third shift, so she was asleep. And James' dad, he was a truck driver, so he was on the road, and he just got in, so he was asleep. And so we got the station, like, you got one call, who are you gonna call? So I called my mom, of course she didn't answer. Cause we didn't wanna call James' dad, cause he's a big, mean guy. <laughs> no, he was a nice guy, but I knew it was gonna be rough if we had to call him. So ended up having to call him and waking him up and he came and got us. It took him a while, but he finally showed up and got us and got us out of jail. Really wasn't in jail, but we sat in the office. When we got out, I was like, where's my fishing rods? Cause I had five fishing rods. I had three and James had two of them. I said, where's my fishing rods? She said, well, 
you know, we've, we've got a couple of them, but we broke two of them. I said, you broke two of my rods? I said, y'all got to pay for that. So they're like, no, I said, y'all were trespassing. I said, oh, that's my rods. You got to pay for them. They ended up buying me two new rods, police department. <laughs> so I got two new rods out of it. And, and it was fun because I would sit here and watch, you know, the patrol cars come by whenever I knew people were down there fishing. And we'd wait till the police officers left, and I'd go down and walk the banks and find fishing rods and stuff where people would leave them <laughs> running from the law. So it was a lot of fun. All these years I was sneaking in fishing at this lake, and this that's a well-known lake for big fish. Um, a lot of big crappy, two to three, sometimes four pounders out of there. Bass were eight to 10 pounds, which is really big for a lake like this. And this is a reservoir where the town gets the water from, so that's why it was illegal to fish in it. Uh -huh. but, so I grew up on these roads here. Of course, you see these hills, we had a lot of good sledding a lot of good bicycle riding. And we'd always put a barrel out here and have a fire burning for the people sledding in the neighborhood. Did it snow every winter back then? Oh yeah, then? it snowed a lot every winter. And then so after Tiny left, after we got caught, Tiny ended up leaving and uh, Mr. Black lived right here. He had two daughters I went to school with, Kim and Kelly Black. They were twins. Well, he ended up being the game warden. And he was mean. He write his own mama a ticket. <laughs> so we didn't fish much after that. Then by then I had my license and I was able to drive around to go High Rock, Lake Norman, wherever fishing. So me and James, my buddy, would get off of school on Fridays and take off to High Rock most of the time and fish up at High Rock on the banks. You think you would have gotten as into fishing as you were if you didn't? move into that house or have access to it like that? Yeah, I was into fishing. And like I said, my dad, Jack, he took me fishing all the time. We'd go all these little farm ponds and fish and you'd pay like two bucks and go in there and fish all, however many people you had with you. I, mean, I always grew up fishing. Never did hunt with my stepdad or my dad, Jack. Now I'm take you out, show you the schools and tell you some of the stories about the schools. This channel and doing these videos is our full-time job. It's a lot of work and we'd like it to grow. If you're enjoying this stuff, it would cost absolutely nothing for you to help us by hitting the thumbs up button on this. And if you're watching on a TV, which statistically half of you are, maybe you could pull out your phone or go onto a desktop and leave a thumbs up. This is the furthest I would ride to. We'd ride up this store right here on the corner. We had five different stores we could go to, so we hit all of them during the week. And this little building right here on the left is my elementary school. It was Enoville Elementary, and in 2021, they closed the elementary school down, and now it's a church family life building. And it was K through sixth. Some mean teachers, and a lot of time with the mean, kind of in-school suspension back then, oh, yeah. where you get in trouble and you had to go to this classroom and do all your work and not even look at nobody. Oh, I and did that too, yeah. This guy was mean. He was, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Eisenhower, big old feller, and uh, he was uh, also a Kannapolis police officer at the time too. So he would do this during the day and then go to work in the police department in the evenings. And he, uh, he, he was a nice guy, but he was mean if you were mean and got in trouble. And one time I remember our teachers, we had, we, this, this cl cl uh, school we changed classes. We didn't stay in one classroom. We would go to like a history, English, and um, math and different classes like that and we had a math teacher she was really nice i loved her to death and i love math too so that might have been why it was her birthday so one of the students brought cakes this girl she brought cakes for her birthday for the class to eat her mom made but she didn't have no candles so me and a couple guys on the back side was her classroom we jumped out of the window and their store is right there so we ran over there and we bought some candles from the store and come back and climb back in the window as we was climbing back in, she come back into the classroom and caught us. <laughs> and it was for her birthday, but we still got in trouble. And that's one of the times I had to go to see Mr. Eisenhower at ISS. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. And I can remember one time we were sitting here in a classroom right there next to the door, right at that little archway was my English teacher. And I didn't like her too well. She was mean. A lot of mean people here. Oh yeah, a lot of mean people, and she was really mean. We'd think she had a night, some kind of night activities going on that she did to make up 
for pay or something. I don't know if you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, you know, she'd always come. And I, I was bad about not doing homework. Like I said, I got off school and jumped on the bicycle, and I got home and took off for the evenings and really didn't do homework. So she come around and she's checking homework. I said, I ain't got mine. She said, you haven't learned anything either. You know that ain't is not a word. I said, you watch. One day it will be. <laughs> she said, it's not in the dictionary. I said, it will be, and now it is. So I don't know if I had anything to do with that. But. Did you ever find she, her and tell her you told her so? No, I hadn't seen her. Miss Hedrick was her name. I hadn't seen her after that, and she was redheaded. Um, pretty lady, but she was mean. And we, one time I was sitting there in the classroom, and I was looking out the window and just staring and daydreaming like I always do. And a van came by, and I had to backtrack later in the show here to tell about the story. But a van came by, and it was a blue and yellow van. And this is at the time I was in the sixth grade, and I kind of knew about my life, what had happened with, you know, Jack adopted me, and I had a dad out there, and you know, I knew who he was, and I'd done talk to him on the phone by this time. But that's all I did. I got talked to him on the phone. Well, a van came by, and it was a blue and yellow van, and he drove for Wrangler back then. I always thought, I wonder if that was him, just checking, you know, riding by checking on me. And I never knew, I never found out, but I don't think he ever had a blue and yellow van. I think it was just a coincidence. We'll have to get to that story later because it's a little out of the way to be able to do the route I want to do to be with everything. Sixth grade, well, it was going into my sixth grade year. It was during, in between the year fifth and sixth grade during the summer that I learned about my dad and got to talk to him on the phone, which snuck off because my stepdad, Jack, he didn't want anything to do with me having any, any communication with my dad or anything. So my dad's sister, or brother Danny Earnhardt, his wife Sherry Earnhardt, and my mom were all good friends. And so one time we got slipped off to Sherry and Danny's house, and Sherry had set it up where I could call and talk to dad. And so we had a little conversation, and. You know, mom, we went in there and Sherry called and put me on the phone with him. And I said, hello. And he said, hey, he said, how you doing? It's good. And it wasn't much to talk about because we really didn't know each other. And no, you know, I didn't know what to ask him. I was going into the sixth grade, so I was young. I had no clue what kind of questions to ask. But we had a little small talk. And he said, all right, well, we'll, 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 hopefully we'll try to get to see each other sometime. I said, okay, I said, we'll see. I don't know if that'll happen, but we'll see. And that was it. Well, that Christmas, I ended up getting a present from Santa Claus, but I found out it was from Dad. It was a racetrack, one of them electric racetracks. You sit there and control with the little finger. Slot cars. And you had a little, yeah, slot car track. So I played with that thing, and it was, of course, you know, it had all the race cars, and one of them disappeared one time. It was the number three car <laughs> that disappeared. I don't know how, but I feel like I do. But I played with that thing until it wouldn't work no more. And so that lake I was telling you about I fished in, that's it right there. That's Canapas Lake. Really? It's got the golf course on it. So you said your mom it's, and Danny's wife were friends. Did you ever meet Danny when you were younger, not knowing that he was actually your uncle? No, I, whenever I went to you know, called Dad, talked to him for the first time on the phone. That Danny was there too, so I, I got I knew Danny because Sherry and Mama being friends. Um, I didn't really know about the relationship. I just thought it was friends. But as you know, I got to learn about Dad, or you know, who my dad really was, my my real dad was. I learned then that Uncle Danny, or Danny was my uncle. Um, my mom finally told me about all that. And of course, it was a secret deal. I couldn't talk about it because of my dad, Jack. I'm trying to figure out what's better if the, like, because it's like light in here, but yeah. it, then it's halfway across your face. So yeah, I'm well, not sure what's better like or not. It yeah. cuts off. And so at, after that, learning about you know, who my dad was, my, my blood father, I guess you call it. You know, I met Uncle Danny and knowing he's my uncle and got to hang out with him. And, you know, we really didn't go off doing things. We just kind of went to our house a time or two and hung out and ate dinner and stuff like that. When you were born, where were they living at? Man, I don't know that. That's what I'm saying. That, that trailer's the first house I know I remember anything about. 
And I know it was a little white house, but I don't know where it was at. Because I saw pictures of it. I actually saw a picture of my Papa Ralph holding me when I was, I mean, I, was, I wasn't even walking. Or maybe just learning to walk at that time, whenever he held me in that picture. But that's all I have is that picture, and I don't know where it's at now, because look, some of my mom's passed, and my sister, J JJ, took care of all the papers and pictures and everything, and it's funny how events in life happens, and, you know, people spread out and go different ways, and you'll, like, I ain't talked to my sister, JJ, in a couple of years, just, you know, way things go life goes different ways you know we're on the road all the time with my daughter Kayla rodeoing and she's out in Oklahoma so she's between Oklahoma Texas and Kansas rodeoing and we try to hit all of them to support her I'm gonna do something I just learned that was illegal but I'm gonna do it anyway because I kind of rerun this route just to kind of get an idea and I didn't know that this one road had changed the way it did so I grew up playing baseball and football through school and got into high school I started wrestling a little bit but for baseball we would practice right here at this field so that sign back said no left turn and I'm sorry I did anyway <laughs> the woman behind me is looking at me like what are you doing so this is my junior high school right here in front of us this is the main building Corey Light Middle School called junior high, that's what I called it. And so this is where I went to junior high school and we had seventh through ninth at this school. And during PE, we would get to swim in the swimming pool in the summertime. And that's where I learned, I start swimming at. That's how I learned to swim, right there in that pool. And this was a good school. We had, I had a lot of good teachers, never had any major issues. You know, I was still a kid and got in a little bit of trouble. Less mean people. Here and there, yeah, less mean people. And so that's where I went to junior high school at. And we had a vocational building because, you know, we, we grow so much. So that little building over there with all the boards on it now was our vocational building. Like we'd have to cross to go over to there to classes. I had social studies and English over here, and all my other classes was in that little main building. I had all my little notes written down, but I, don't, I left them. <laughs> I left them at home. And so, yeah, I started driving when I was started in high school. And that's where we're heading to now. We're going to head to my high school. It was Southrend Raiders. And this is where I learned about life. In what context? In debt, as an adult. It's about being an adult. It took them a while, but they finally got it into me. My wife says they haven't yet. But. <laughs> so this is my high school, and that's... Our baseball fields where we played baseball. Um, I don't know how it is these days about driving through school campus, but we'll find out. What position were you in baseball? I uh, played pitching and shortstop and catching. And of course, our football fields back there. We'll, we'll get around to that in a minute. But this was my high school. It was South Rand. Back then, whenever I went to school, it was just this part right here. That new red roof back there, that wasn't even there back there on the back. It was just a little long building right here. And then up to my, halfway through my 11th grade, they started moving pods in. It's like little trailers. Hmm. They would set out on the back side behind this building here where that red roof is. They had pods out back there. I didn't get in a whole lot of trouble here that I remember. What were you driving when you were driving yourself to high school? Well, so when I was 14 years old, my uncle, my mom's brother, bought a 65 Impala off the showroom floor, brand new, and he gave it to my cousin in Georgia, and then from there, my cousin got another car, and the Impala was sitting there, so he uh, passed it down to me, and so I took over the 65 Impala, and it sat in the backyard. It had the wiring harnesses burn up. So it needed wiring, heart, new wiring and everything. So we sit there in the backyard for a long time and done nothing with it. I had a guy come by one day, just stop and say, hey, I got a 72 Chevelle, I'll trade you even. 
Miss Bell was running and was able to drive, just put a tag on it and go. So that's what I did. I traded for that San Francisco Bell, and that's what I drove to high school. That's a pretty cool high school yep. car. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And then uh, after that, I bought me a 70 Chevelle. So I had a 70 and a 72 Chevelle. I'd drive you know, one different time, just whenever, whichever one I felt like. You're just balling that The 72 <laughs> was uh, just a regular car. It wasn't no SS. It was just a regular Chevelle. The 70 was an SS. It had a 454, uh, four-speed, hers four-speed. Uh, my the Impala, I wish I could, I wish I'd never done that because that 65 Impala had a 396 with a horse Hurst four speed and it was a really nice car. About to turn 16, and the guy would come by and had a car that was running, able to drive at the time, and I was ready to go. So that's what I did. Yeah, back then they weren't those kind of cars weren't looked at. How no, they are I now. didn't know. The car. No, it wasn't like that. I mean, it was a boat, a big old <laughs> boat. What it was, just glide across. So this is the backside. This is our shop and uh, electrical building where Freddie Query and I can't remember my wood wood shop guy's name. Mr. Price, uh, this is where we worked on, you know, wood, wood shop and our electrician. And now they got automotive in there. Did you know Freddie was a racer back I then? I did not. No, yeah. I did not know he raced. I was on you as an electri electri electrical teacher, electrician. And I didn't know about Freddie Query until I actually started running street stocks at Concord. And that's where I learned about Freddie Query. You're like, oh, dang, that guy was my teacher in yep. high school what yep and so that's our football field over there at the field goals i don't want to go in there because we might cause a big issue with what days <laughs> are these days in schools and stuff and it's probably ain't nobody coming out yet so during the off season there's a big parking lot you go through that right side and it's a big old open parking lot there where the buses are and all we'd come down here when it's snowing and do donuts and stuff and <laughs> do burnouts you know when it wasn't snowing we'd still come down here and do donuts and burnouts and stuff one time we got in trouble, got caught, but they didn't do nothing. Just told us not to come back. It's a win. Yeah, back yeah. then that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. These days they want to call the law and lock you up and everything. Yeah, they'll take your parking pass. That's what happened to me when parking I did that. <laughs> I didn't even have a parking pass. We just come here trying to find a spot to park. So that's my school days. What was your first job? I can get to that. You start talking about like having all these Chevelles and stuff. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll get to that. So now we're gonna head out. Uh, I'm gonna head out to Jackson Park, where I played baseball to get to that story about learning about my dad. You know, growing up in Kannapolis, we'll get down to that shortly. But you know, it was called Idiot Circle. It was just a loop around a median downtown Kannapolis, and everybody just circled around or you know, parked on the side of the road and hung out. So of course, you know, we driving cars, you always cruise the local area. So we'd hit Con uh, Kannapolis and do a couple laps there and we didn't hit anybody we seen or knowed or hung out. We always shoot down to Concord and run that strip. And I always knew a lot of people in Concord. So we'd go down through there and you know, ride by a couple laps and find out where everybody was hanging out, what parking lot and you'd park in the gas station parking lot or uh, was a store that was closed parking that parking lot and just hang out sitting on the front of the bumper or front of the car or hanging out and waving at girls and whistling you know <laughs> you do any street racing back then back then oh yeah <laughs> uh, honestly in my Chevelle I didn't do a whole lot in my Chevelles because uh, I had to work on them I worked on all of them by myself I didn't want to I knew what it was about then, so I didn't tear them up. But my dad had an S10 he'd give me to drive, and I raced this Mustang coming back from Concord Mall one time on the back side on Highway 3. It was just a long stretch, nothing on it but woods. And I ripped out second gear at that moment when I was racing him. But still, it was a pretty close race. He had a 350 in the truck. It was a built 350 and four speed, a Muncie four speed in it. So I did dog it pretty good. And then he quit letting me drive it. Was it Jack's truck? No, it was, or your... it was Dale's. Okay, I wasn't sure what, what yep. age yep. you were doing this, this at. This is Where was, was the crossover? Did you I was find out 17. Quit letting you drive it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to change transmission and everything. <laughs> 
he, he was wanting, he was make, wanting to make me tear it apart and do it over, and I said, no, you don't want to do that. I've never done that before. I said, if you want it to work, just give me another transmission. I'll put it in there. <laughs> and then I don't know where the truck went after that. Growing up, like I said, I played baseball and football. I played for this one that's like a rec team. It was called uh, Canapolis JCs. And my dad, Jack, he was the coach. He, he coached all my baseball growing up, except for when I was in the high school. This is where we played baseball at. Bunch of workers in here. Well, we're gonna see if they have any problem with us pulling in. Um, of course, it wasn't like this back when I played. This was all open field and we had one baseball field. It was back in that back corner. Didn't even have a building there. Had little porta johns for the restrooms. And this was all grass parking right here. And I don't know, I, I must have been like 12, 13 years old. I have white blonde hair. Our uniforms were green and had Canapolis JCs on it. Through these games we play, I always seen this woman with these two girls that always, you know, there and I'd be after the game walking out to the car and they would be there watching me walk and I'm like, oh, that's weird. So maybe I'm that good ball player. They're looking at me, you know, scouting or something. <laughs> I don't know. But come to find out, I was walking out one time and this woman come walking up with the two girls and said, Carrie Dells, yes, I'm Martha, I'm your memo. from Martha Earnhardt. And this is your cousin, Jennifer and Ashlyn. I'm like, oh. I said, so what? And she said, well, it's a long story. I said, just ask your mama about it. So I just wanted to say hello. I said, I noticed y'all been out here watching and everything, and I just kind of wondered what it was about. And I said, this is odd. So, of course, you know, I didn't say anything to my stepdad, anything he didn't say. I don't know if he even saw it. But we got home, and it was stepdad was out he had a building behind that house a brick house i was telling you about he worked on golf clubs in he was out in the shop working on golf clubs building a set of clubs for somebody and i told my mom i said yo i said at ball game this woman and these two girls always there watching me and you know, like i'd walk out to the car and they said they watch me well I said, today after the game i was walking out and she come up and told me she was my mama earnhardt martha and the, my cousins jennifer and ash and, and mama said yeah so, so she told me the whole story then. That's when I learned about my dad, Dale Earnhardt. So you talked to him on the phone before, but you didn't know anything about him? Well, no, actually, I hadn't talked to him. This is before I talked to him. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is before I talked to him. This is how I knew. When I told you about the story about how I knew about my dad, this is where I learned about my dad. Okay. My man, my Earnhardt. Well, did you know you were adopted at that time? Not at that time, I didn't. So you thought that Jack was your biological yep. father? Yep. And so whenever I met my mama and my cousins here that day, and I went and talked to my mama that night about it, and that's when I, she told me the whole story about, you know, her and dad got married and I was born and then they separated and divorced. And then Jack and her got married and he adopted me. And that's how I learned about who Jack was and who Dell was. Wow. And okay. so after that, they came and, you know, I, I talked to him. I started talking to him more and more. And, and Jack, I, I don't know if he ever, I know he knew who Martha was. And I don't know if he just didn't say anything about it or if he didn't see me talking to him. But I talked to him occasionally every now and then. And, and I told my mom, I said, well, when I get 16, when I turn 16, I'm going to get my license. And I'm first place I'm going is your house. She said, well, you're more than welcome to come over. So I said, all right. And so, well, at, back up to after I met them is whenever, you know, my mom started telling me the stories and all the things and worked it out with Sherry for me to be able to call my dad. Okay. That's how all that circle background, that's how all that happened is after meeting them and learning about who my dad was, mom told me about Sherry and Danny and everything. That's how I learned about them. And then we arranged to be able to talk to dad on the phone because I wasn't able to see him still. Um, and my stepdad, Jack, he, my adopted dad, he didn't know that I knew all, all the stuff I knew at that time. I don't, I don't remember how 
Jack learned about me know, knowing and learning about my dad. I don't know how all that came about. But when I was, I'm jumping ahead here. We'll, we'll go back to that. What but was so, that like internally finding out that? It's, it's, all, it's all confusing. Um, were you mad? Were you No, sad? I wasn't like, mad. I, uh, I wasn't mad. I was just confused and had uh, thoughts of why and how, you know, what all happened at that time when I met them. And, but as me and my mom talked more and more, I, I became to understand everything. Um, you know, you, they were young, kind of the story I lived is they were young and they got pregnant and got married and had me and it just didn't work out. Um, because I think I was two years old, roughly, area, whenever they separated. Then, like I said, of course, Jack came along, and that's that's who I grew up with as my dad was Jack. And I had, like I said, I had a great life with him. He taught me a lot about, you know, fishing and golfing. He helped me work on cars in the garage occasionally on my, you know, 70 Chevelle and 72 Chevelle. At that time, I didn't know a lot about automotives, and like the Impala was a. I mean, it could have been you know re, rewired, could have been new wired harness in it and all, but he wasn't in depth in that, that deep in the auto mechanics to know all the stuff about that. So that's why that Impala never got fixed. Was there a difference in the way you saw the world before you learned all that, and then after it? Did it, did it change yeah, you? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think it changed me. It just, I always had that wonder what life would have been or how life would have been if the outcome of their marriage had been different. And, you know, I always thought, well, if that was the case, we would, as, as I got older, I always wondered if that was the case, where would Dale Jr. and, Del and Kelly be and Taylor? Where, where, where would all that be right now? Would they even be here? It would have been with my mom if they had stayed married, or would they just had two kids and quit? Or I don't know. Um, you know, my dad was married. He, Teresa was his third wife. So as I started dating and learning about life, I got a girl pregnant when I was 18, and we had to get married. Well, we didn't have to, but we thought it was the right thing to do. We got married, had. Bobby, my oldest one, and then two years later we had Jeffrey, and the day after he was born I left, because it just didn't, it wasn't right, it, wasn't, it didn't work out, we wasn't a good couple, it, didn't, it just wasn't a good marriage. So I chose to leave and still had visitation rights on weekends, every other weekend for my boys and all, but, and I, I guess that's when I seen you know, how it could happen with dad and mom being young and getting married and it just it wasn't, it didn't work. Did it kind of bring that full circle, like to it help did. understand it better? Yes, it did. Um, like I said, you know, I never thought, when I learned about dad, I never thought about why he walked out on us or anything like that. I never thought that way. I just, you know, I thought what life would be if things had been different, or how can how can our life maybe come back together sometime? And then one day that all happened. But going back to our Chevelle days, like being able to have the vehicles and stuff, I had two jobs. This was my second job. Right here? Yep. It was a gas station. And it had three bays we worked on cars. The first one with the North Carolina Inspection Station was our oil change bay. Another two was our mechanic side where we do transmissions and all kind of motors and everything. And so I pumped gas right there. The gas pumps are going in and it's all changed. But I worked for a guy named Bub Benton. It was Bub's Automotive back then. And um, I've recently reached out to him um, about getting some stories, maybe have him to meet us here and talk. and maybe have some pictures and stuff, but um, I learned through his wife, and this has been, I've seen him about three months, four months ago, and he was perfectly fine. 
But his wife said he's gotten where he don't remember things now, so he's not in any shape to be um, getting about because he don't remember things. And she was going to try to find some pictures, and she couldn't find any for me, so we have the building to show for it. Use your imagination. Yes. So there's two gas pumps there. I'd be in there changing oil and, you know, you'd be changing here, ding, ding. There's a little bell that says somebody's pulling up to get gas. So I'd come out, pump the gas. We'd pump gas, wash the windshield, check the oil for them while they was getting fuel. And so I get done pumping gas, I go back and finish the oil change. Hmm. And back then we didn't really have waiters where they'd come in and get oil change and wait. They'd just drop the car off and leave it with us, which was nice because you wasn't in a rush and, you know, might mess up something. Did you ever mess anything up? No, I didn't. Uh, Bub, Bub taught me a lot. He was a he was a good mechanic, and uh, he was a highly sought after mechanic. After he closed this down, a couple of the dealerships local uh, hired him to come in and train some of their employees, and also to do some of their work. He was good with carburetors, uh, four barrel carburetors. Hard to find somebody that could rebuild them and get them tuned right, and he was one of the masters at it sad to see you know as life goes and we get older things happen and it's sad to see him in the state he's in right now um because he was a fine fellow he, he always called me rascal he said you rascal you and uh how'd you get that name i don't know he, he just called me rascal oh. he always said you <laughs> rascal you and uh you know just picking at me so i was out here pumping gas one day and i was in high school still and this is the time when I was about 18 years old, about to turn 18 actually. I was, I was still 17, about to turn 18. A couple of weeks away from turning 18 when we found out my girlfriend was pregnant at the time. And we you know, talked about getting married. Her dad was a preacher. He was a Church of God preacher. So, you know, what they say about preacher's daughters. Yeah, I learned. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting here pumping gas and this blue Camaro, is a redhead girl, always come in here and get gas. Her dad, had an account with us and I was sitting there pumping her gas one day and this truck pulls in. The, the pumps were right on the other side and two, three cars lined up there but where that median grass is. She was on the opposite side. She come in this way and pulled in and here comes this truck pulls in and just slams on brakes. Get in the truck! And Dad. And of course, you know, I learned about Dad and got to be around him and everything at that time. She said, come on, get in the truck. I said, I can't, I got, you know, I'm pumping gas. He says, I don't care, get in the truck. I said, Bob. He comes out, I said, I gotta go, I'm sorry, I'll be back, hopefully. <laughs> so hopefully. I jump in the truck, we ride around, Dad's like, so, what y'all gonna do? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you and your girl. I said, well, I said, we're gonna get married. We got a baby on the way. He said, yeah, I know. He said, maybe you ought to do something different. I said, no, I don't think so. He said, it's not right. It's not gonna work out. I said, well, Dad, you don't really know her. I said, you know, we made a mistake and we gotta own up to it and we gotta make it right. You're making a mistake. He said, I already sent you off to boarding school, that uh, military school that Dale Jr. and Kelly went to. I said, no, nah, you can't do that. I'm, I'm, you know, 18 almost. And said, you can't do that. He said, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I'm like, well, maybe you can. I said, but no, I don't want to do that. I said, I, I think it's the right thing to get married and try to, you know, support the family. He said, well, I'm just telling you, it's not going to work out. He said, you take my advice and we'll do whatever you want to do. He said, just remember what I told you. And he was right. Like I said, about three years almost is what we were married before I left. So I made it two and a half to two and three quarter years. So I feel like I was right a little bit. Well, you beat him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I remember that was a scary ride when he come in there and got me. So that was a job I would come and work right after school. I'd come in there, get there about 3.30, pump gas and change oil. I did, you know, I'd got to change belts and all daters. I went in the major mechanic. He wouldn't let me do the big stuff, so. After I would get off from there, I would head over to my other job, which is the first job I ever had. At that time, you, the get in the truck story, were there many of those like dad kind of moments? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, so 
after I talked to Dad on the phone one time, he was going to have an appearance in the dealership here in Kannapolis. It was uh, Widenhouse Motors. And he was supposed to be there with his race car and signing autographs. And I talked my mom into bringing me up here to meet him for the first time. So she she followed it for a while. Finally, she gave in. So it was right at right at Food Line. So she parked in Food Line parking lot and let me walk across the street to White House Motors. And the car was there on the trailer, it was Monte Carlo, the blue and yellow Wrangler car. And so I went and set up on the fender wheel by the car and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and, waited and, and finally they come out and said, you know, he wasn't able to make it. Some things come up and he wasn't going to be able to make it. So I'm like, man, geez. You know, I thought it was going to be a good time getting to meet him. And now looking back on it, would it have been a good time? Mm -hmm. at, at, a, at one of his appearances that we meet, you know, and he's got these people he's got to entertain. The funny thing, it was a secret deal because my dad, Jack, he didn't, still wasn't okay with this all happening. And so my mom sat across the street at Food Line on the corner, leaning against the telephone post. And on the sports page of that Sunday's paper, this is on Saturday, he's supposed to, that sports page on Sunday's paper was my mom leaning against that telephone pole. Huh. Delano Hawk fans are lined up. <laughs> and there, there's your mom. And there's on my the front mom. Page. So we had to get rid of that paper real quick. In the age before cameras being everywhere, she yes. still got busted. Yes. <laughs> and so here's a little uh, bowling alley we used to come to and bowl at. We come here on the weekends and bowl, and Saturday, oh, it was on Saturdays during the day we'd come there and bowl. My mom would bring us up here. But on Friday nights, this is before I got my license. On Friday nights, we'd go roller skating. And actually, it's, it's still open. We came by the other day and there was people packed in there. The parking lot was full. I thought it shut down, but it was still open. I remember having lock-ins there. You come up here on Friday nights and skate and they lock the doors and you stay all night skating. Hmm. Sleep on the little benches they had. But this right here is called Skate Land on the left there. The roller rink. Doesn't look like much has changed. No, the That's building's the same. Same sign. Yeah, everything's the same. Was this with the uh, inline or with the four and a it's square? The four, yeah. It was old school roller skating. So here's my first job. Pizza the old hut. Pizza Hut. <laughs> She's all revamped now, though. And the drive through used to be in the back right here. That's where I started working. I started out washing dishes. And Dan, I can't remember Dan's last name. He was my manager back then. He was a cool guy. He had real blonde, curly hair. He was a really fun manager. He, had, he didn't, he wasn't mean. He, he, you know, he knew you was here as a teenager working to make money to support your habits on weekends, chasing girls and racing cars up and down the streets. So I started out washing dishes and I went to working at the uh, drive through window taking care of the customers in there and then I went to making pizzas. Like actually we had we'd make the dough at night before we close and it would sit in the cooler all night long and get up the next day and there's big old trash cans, them old gray trash cans on wheels. We'd make them in that. And so whenever it comes next morning the crew would come in and roll out the amount of dough that you need to make a pizza with, different sizes. And that like I said that's after I got off from the gas station. First, after I got off of school, this is where I came to for my first job. And making pizzas and we'd work all day and then at night we'd close around 11 o'clock and we'd clean up till one, two o'clock in the morning because we was having fun. <laughs> we'd had a, it was all tile in there. The floor was tile and we had booths and then you had a, the salad bar. Yeah, we had the salad bar out there in the middle where you get up and make your own salad. And so after we bust the salad bar down, put everything up, it was time to mop. So we'd take the mop, soapy water, and just throw it across the floor. And we'd get in the back at the drive through window and take off running as a straight shot through the front counter and just see who could slide the feathers <laughs> and who busted the butt more, which I did a couple times. And so after I'd done making pizzas, 
I started busting tables a little bit, tried to see what it was about getting tips, and I didn't like that too good. <laughs> he was messing with dirty dishes and stuff that people eat off of. When I was washing, it wasn't bad because they were, you know, you had your hands in soapy water and all, but out here you didn't. You had a rag you wipe your hands on. I don't know how many times you wipe your hands on that same rag. <laughs> so I went back to making pizzas, and of course, you know, back then they had the cups that you had measurements for your green peppers and your onions and different things. You had certain amounts you had to put on each size. Uh, no, I had them plastic gloves. I just grab and throw a bunch on there. <laughs> I mean, I made a lot of pizzas with a lot of ingredients, and I had a lot of friends would come through to drive through and. I'd slip them a pizza or two every now and then. <laughs> and the sad thing, though, at night, after everything's done, all that dough that you had made that you know that night before, what was left, you had to take and throw in the dumpster. And it was like, man, why can't we make these and you know take them out to the needy people or whatever? And you couldn't do that just because of food, whatever the food association rules were, you couldn't do that. So I would make a lot of pizzas up and take them to buddies or over to my dad's race shop and hand them out over there because they were working late nights over there. So I'd take all the pizzas I could make and I'd, I'd make six or seven pizzas at night after we close. Didn't have to pay for them either. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Damn, my manager, he was he was good with that. He let me do that, so that was neat. But so yeah, this is my first job and this is actually where I met Bub Benton. He come in here and him and his wife came in here and eat and he's, that's when I was busting tables. I was walking through there, and he says, hey, so you work on cars? I said, well, I don't really work on cars. I kind of know a little bit about them. So you change oil? I said, yeah. He said, you know how I pump gas? I said, well, yeah, I pump my gas. He said, why don't you come by and see me and give me his card? So that's whenever I went and talked to Bob Benton and got me a job at the gas station. So he posted you from Pizza Hut? And so I told <laughs> Dan, my manager, I said, hey, man, I, said, I got a job that's in, you know, working in cars, around cars, and I like cars. I said, you mind if I change my hours up? He said, no, I said, you go ahead. So I, like I said, I'd get off of school at three o'clock and go over there at 3.30 and start pumping gas, changing oil till five. We closed the building at five. And then we come over here and work at the pizza hut and close it down in night times. You made any pizzas recently? Yeah, I make pizzas at home. You make me yeah. pizza? Yeah, I love my pizzas. Everybody <laughs> loves my pizzas. <laughs> we, we, I'll make some good pizzas. I don't make my own dough, but I do all my own ingredients and stuff. And of course, that building right there at Canapolis Family Restaurant used to be a place called McCabe's. It was, there's just a sign right there, I see it. McCabe's Steakhouse. That was a high-end steakhouse, like for proms. That's where everybody took their dates for dinner. I've been there four times. I've been to three, four proms in school, in high school for three years. But my year after I got out, a buddy of mine went into the Marines and he called me up, his girlfriend, fiance at the time, wanted to go to the prom, but didn't want to go because he wasn't here. So he called me up and asked if I'd take her, and I took her <laughs> as for him. And Rhonda Sellers, I actually ran across a picture of that the other day. I was going to do pictures, it was me and her. It was kind of awkward, but interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like fill in. Everybody's like, oh, what's going on here? So, well, I said, I'm just doing a favor. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I told you about talking to my mom, my mamma at the ballpark and all, and told her whenever I got my license, I was going to come first place, it was going to be to her house. So, I got to stay out of school one Friday, and my mom took me up to uh, Salisbury, a little DMV station up there, and got my license. So, I went back home and dropped my mama's off because I had my 72 Chevelle at that time. That's why I did my license test drive in. So I dropped my mom off and said, I'm going to go cruise around, I'm going to go riding. So I right, just, you know, be careful. So first time out soloing, back then you didn't have to, you didn't have to wait. When you got your license, you was able to go. So I come up through here in that 72 Chevelle and roll through up here. And I parked right here. And this is my memo's house. This is where her and Ralph had their life and raised their kids. And their race shop, my grandpa raced out of, is in the backyard 
which we're gonna walk around there and look at, and that's where my dad raced out of. So let's jump out real quick. So I got in the car and I walked up this, well, I cut across the corner because I was hiding from the shop back. back. You were trying to hide on purpose? Yeah, I was trying to hide on purpose because I was going to meet my, I mean, going to hang out with my mamma and meet someone for the first time. It was actually gonna happen. So I walked in, my mamma met me at the front door and we went in and sat in there and talked and she's like, well, are you ready? I'm like, no, no, not yet. And I sat there for probably about two, two and a half hours trying to build up the courage to walk out back to the race shop to meet my dad for the first time. Finally, I got the courage up and we walked through and you go through the living room into another sitting room into the kitchen. And when you get to the kitchen, you come into a little hallway to the back door. And so I walk out the back door and I hear all this laughing and commotion going on and tools clanging together, music playing. So I walk out the back door and I come down and there's a couple cars parked here and there. And it was like Tony Sr. and Dad, Rick Boss, you know, all them guys here working on race cars. So I come up and everything's locked now, but I open the door, walk in and Dad is sitting over in this corner on that bench back there, working. And when I walked in, Tony Jr. or Tony Sr. and Rick Boss were working on the cars right here. There's two cars in here. And my dad stops and looks up and everything gets quiet. He said, well, hey, son. So what you doing? I said, well, I said, I come in and say hello and to meet you. And we sit there and talk for a long time. And Tony Sr. and Rick Boss, we all just hung out talking. And from there on, you know, dad's like, well, so, you know, we need to start hanging out more. So we kind of, I don't remember what all we did, but, you know, we, during that time, he has bought this place over on Highway 3 and did all the race shop stuff over there. So we kind of rode out there, and this is when he still had the woods and everything. So I was out there, and he had a little brick building for the office, which is a house, is all that was there. So. We kind of rode around the farm. He was showing me all the stuff and all his plans and everything. And speaking of the devil, there's my Aunt Kathy. All the neighbors called and said somebody's over here and they know Shelly was at work. Yeah. And so they didn't know who was messing around. Well, Shelly didn't call you? I just talked to Shelly. I don't even remember now. I think you were talking about cars being in there and you came outside and then you started coming here more. Oh, yeah. Well, what? You know, I was talking about how Dad had the property at Highway 3, which is now Dollar Hart Incorporated. It was just all pine trees and woods with that little brick house on it, which was an office at the time. And uh, he built a little shop in the back. It was like a, a storage building, basically. It was a metal, big metal building. And he moved all this operation over to Highway 3. And, you know, I got to start. That's where I mainly hung out with Dad's over there at the race shop at Dollar Hart Incorporated. Um, I was there, saw them tear all the trees down out front where the big buildings are now. It used to be all pine trees. Um, the brick house is not even there no more. You know, we had a lot of fun getting to know each other and being together. Uh, I remember after we met here, he invited me to come over for Christmas and stay Christmas Eve and wake up and do Christmas morning with him, Kelly, and Dell Jr. Well, I'll back up before that. He invited me to come by the house and meet Kelly and Dell Jr. and Teresa. And they lived over on, high, on Lake Norman. And I remember going down, pulling up to the house, and Dell Jr.'s in the front yard playing with a couple of buddies, playing football. And he's a little thing, you know, a little bee thing. And I get out, and he looks and waves and goes back to playing football. And I go knock on the door, and um, the door opens and then shuts. And then Dad comes to the door. It's Teresa to answer the door. So she, opened and shut the door and told dad I was there, I guess, and dad came and invited me in and called Dell Jr. in. We all sat there and I got to meet Kelly. She was inside down in her room in the basement and uh, I got to meet Kelly and Dell Jr. and got to start talking with them and kind of learning each other. Uh, Dell Jr. of course was a lot younger than me, so at the time he was button about <laughs> knowing who I was. He was more about playing with his friends. <laughs> uh, me and Kelly, you know, hit off pretty 
quick. Um, of course, her being a sister, she's a mother hen, because she pretty much took care of Dale Jr. when Dad was on the road all the time. They had a babysitter, but Dale Jr. and Kelly were pretty close, and Kelly matured a lot quick. Um, so I think that's what made it easier for us to connect right off, because she knew the story behind uh, you know, my life more than I did at that time. Kind of went over a couple parties he had at the lake. I went over there and hung out with him and got to play on the boats and the you know water toys and everything. And then he's like, "We know, so we got Christmas coming up. Won't you come and you know stay with us Christmas night or Christmas Eve and wake up and do Christmas with us?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, that'd be fun." So we got to do that. And I don't even remember the gifts. I mean, I know I didn't get any gifts for anybody because <laughs> I, I was you know had my cars I was supporting. Um, it was all new to me, so something different. And it was a lot of fun being able to wake up at Christmas with him um, and Kelly and Doug Jr. Kind of felt odd that I wasn't with my mom and dad, Jack. Mm -hmm. But that's just what happened. So that's where our story went. Uh, that's crazy to hear all of that when you're standing yeah. right here. Right, right like here. Taking it all in. Where he grew up. And Kelly already knew you existed. Yes, yes, yes. Dad told her about me, and you know, Junior, like I said, he was young, didn't care about that stuff. And you know, like all us boys, we went <laughs> into that stuff. I don't remember a lot of stuff in my childhood. Um, you know, I remember you know riding bicycles around the neighborhood and through the woods and stuff, and having motorcycles and stuff like that. But I don't remember family stuff. Yeah. I guess I say. So you never really did any working on cars or anything at this no, garage? Never have. Um, huh. Yeah, not here. Like I said, about the time I come here is whenever he had that property on Highway 3, he was developing into a race shop and moving everything out there. So that's where everything happened with him, wow. working on cars and race cars and stuff like that, which might be another show one day. Hopefully it is. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> I figured it'd be nice to learn about my life growing up and you know, a lot of people more people are knowing about, you know, how I was raised now than they have in the past because of the stories I've told. Um, I had when I'd done Dell Jr.'s podcast, I had several people that hit me on Facebook, man, said I, I didn't realize you had that kind of life. That's that's the life I lived. You know, I was adopted when I was young and grew up not knowing my dad. And then we reunited and had a great life, you know, and They've said that they felt comforted knowing that there's other people out there like that. And there is. There's a lot of us out there that, you know, didn't live in our um, original family life, I guess you'd say. Uh, they've been adopted and raised by a different uh, father or a different mother. It's yeah. interesting to learn how many there is out there. It's, it's fascinating, and it, it is crazy that it does help people. Yeah, it is. You wouldn't, think, is. You wouldn't think that. And, like, and, you know, on the street in Kannapolis, I've run into a guy, and, he come up, shook my hand in tears, man. It's like, man, he said, your, your, your life is just like mine. The story you told on Del Junior Download is what I've lived. That's my life. And we sit there and talked about, you know, his dad not having anything to do with him, uh, you know, having the connection or anything until later in life when he got older and mature and basically an adult. And they reunited and have such a great bond now that they never had, you know, growing up. So it was really cool. Yeah. Well, let's head to Kannapolis where everything's happening. All right. Yeah. Pulling out of this spot on that day. What I do you remember? remember after that. You don't no. remember anything? No. You don't remember driving home thinking, wow, that just happened? No, like, I don't. None of that. I, I guess it was, I mean, I thought, I remember it being special meeting the dad and getting to see him for the first time. And the experience we had was just easy. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have no expectations whenever this all happened. I didn't know what to expect and what to think or anything like that. So it, it was like it just, it was like it just hadn't, it's like it's been normal all the time, the whole, our whole time. You know, it's just, I walked in and we just connected and really didn't talk about like the reasons why it all happened the way it did. We just talked about, you know, getting to see each other again and being able to be together again and doing things that, you know, family does. So if you were, you know, working on cars and not street racing or anything like that uh, in high school, 
whenever you did meet him and started to get to be around race cars more, did that just pour gas on the fire of wanting um, to do stuff with cars? It did. I mean, it made me more interested in cars and wanting to learn more about cars. Like I said, whenever I got to be around him and hanging out with him, I, I was working in, like I said, the gas station and Peace Hut. And then as we come to find out we were pregnant, I ended up going to work at known the cotton mill around here known as Phil Crest Cannon and I worked at uh, Plant 16 which is up in Salisbury I worked third shift up there and started renting a single wide trailer for me and my wife and our kid that was going to be coming at that time just to you know like I said support my family and hone up to what I've done if you like this hometown history tour format, we have also done this with Mark Martin in Batesville, Arkansas, and Kenny Wallace in Valley Park, Missouri. And statistically, a lot of you watching are several years older than I am. I'm 26. If you hit subscribe on the channel, it does not cost anything. All that does is it will show you when we post something new. That's it. That's what that means. So if you don't even have a YouTube account, you can make one or sign in, hit subscribe, and then when you open YouTube and we have a new video, it will be there for you to see it. You won't have to look for it. Downtown Kannapolis. This is where all the cruising happened. And like I said, back in the day, this was a median in the middle and they had parking on the side like these right here. But it was a one, one lane this way and a big median in the middle and you circle and come back. Like, Traffic went this way on this side of the media and traffic went that way on the other side. And, you know, when textile industry struggled and everything happened, Fieldcrest Cannon shut down. It had the twin towers, is what they call the smokestacks, for the mill. And the day that they tore them down and that smokestacks fell, this town just crumbled. Um, it, it just fell apart, nothing, have much businesses going on, it was just vacant, dead, just dead. Do you remember what year that was? I do not. I could look it up, um, probably. Yeah, you probably look it up. You run up that street, and it went all the way up on the right side of them trees, and you go all the way up to the very end and turn around and come back down. You just make a circle a couple times, and like I said, if you see anybody, you knew you could kind of stop and hang out and talk a little bit, or if you didn't, you cruise on the Concord. So it was back and forth all through the night. So after the mill shut down, everything just died here. It was dead, there wasn't nothing here. And this group come in, I wanna say probably five years ago. I mean, these water fountains wasn't even here. They, none of this was. It was just a bunch of old buildings. And a guy from Florida named Kent, and I didn't really know all this until two years ago. A guy from Florida come down and bought the town and hired a guy to come in and re redo the whole town and build it back up. So I got a phone call one day and this guy named Ken um, Lingerfelt called me up and said, hey, said, um, my boy's got a brewery downtown Kannapolis, which is Old Armor Beer Company here. Uh, he said that he does uh, donations every month. He likes to donate to uh, charities because they, they're about giving back. Um, they're veteran-owned, and they do a lot for veterans. Oh, no, y'all come on through. Don't don't let me hold y'all up. In come on in. Photo session. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And so he called me up and said, hey, my boy's wanting to donate to your charity, so I just want to know what your charity was. I said, well, I don't have a charity, but I work with a youth rodeo association that I run. It was um, called the Junior SRA. Is kids from four, year, four years old up to 18 years old. And it's the oldest youth rodeo association of east of the Mississippi. But my daughter started rodeoing, so I went on the board and then I started you know, running, being the vice president, but running the whole organization. And I said, well, let me come and talk to y'all. So he said, yeah, get a couple of you, if you got any military friends or law enforcement, bring them on in with you. So I brought a buddy of mine, he's, uh, he's a canine officer for Highway Patrol and he's also uh, FBI. And then my son-in-law was a, a probation officer. So I brought him in and we sit here and talked. We couldn't ever figure out how to work it out. So we ended up creating Earnhardt, Out, uh, Earnhardt Outdoor Beer, which is a, it was an ale at the time. It's called a Canapa Sale. And so for the pro proceeds from that, I took and donated back to places I wanted to do, like 
a scholarship fund for the high school rodeo association to help the high school kids have a little money to go to college, to college on and do you know a couple little things in the outdoors with outdoor groups stuff like that so it went from that to a coffee shop up the road that we do our hard outdoors coffee with also and then from there there's an old town soap company that contacted us and we're now doing Earnhardt Outdoor body line, men's body line of uh, body sprays and uh, shaving cream, um, a lot, just a lot of different things. So, and working a lot with that. And we, we launched with one scent and now we're actually getting ready to launch another scent now. So, and I think I it's, I it's kind of cool. Yeah, I got a pomade. I like that. Um, <laughs> so, it's kind of cool that Canapples was known for Earnhardt. And it, you know, it's had, has since been, you know, destroyed with the economy and everything, the way it happened with the meal and all, to actually bring the Earnhardt name back into the town. Since it's revitalized and growing, I thought it was neat to have, you know, the Earnhardt Outdoors in downtown Kannapolis. That and is I like cool. working with local, you know, businesses like, you know, the brewery, the coffee shop, and the soap shop is all local owned. There's not no franchises or anything like that. So let's go up here with my aunts. I got both my aunts up here waiting on us. They're probably mad at me, but <laughs> that happens often. And I thought I'd have them to meet us up here around the statue because uh, Kannapolis, many years ago, contributed a statue in dad's honor and um, a special place to meet up because this town meant a lot to my mama. And the statue meant a lot. She would come here and take pictures with people just coming to see the statue and she would always come in and oh, hey how you doing and take pictures so i thought it was pretty neat and i thought it'd be interesting other than the noise makers over there it may be loud but they're building something so yeah i mean that, that's the, the part of the town revamping yeah you gotta have construction going on for that to happen so we just deal with it hey Hi. you got your jitters out of you yet huh? you got your jitters out of you <laughs> well, I've already had Lyle call on me this morning. She came and tried to rest me earlier. I know. <laughs> Neighbors all hanging out, checking well, on. Well, that's how we close, keep up. She keeps close tabs on everything. Okay. I do too. I ride by there every now and then. Yeah. See how Shelly's doing. Yep. Well, I last <laughs> minute called Shelly. She's added to the front yard. I know. Oh my gosh, yes. But it looks good. It does. I'm proud of what she's it done. Does. She's so this is my Aunt Kay and my Aunt Kathy. Hello. Hey, nice like I said, I, had, I, asked them, I asked them to come up and meet me here. <laughs> <laughs> but through, but through this, I've learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought, you know, Mamma lived up the road and worked at Nita, Nita's, and I thought y'all knew a lot about Kannapolis and grew up. Well, technically, being down I here. mean, we came to the movie up here a lot. We, yeah. We did come up town occasionally, you know, but we were in the county schools at Weintov. And mm -hmm. so we didn't come up town all the time. I do remember coming up town with my friends to the movie, and that's basically it. And I even remember uh, Nancy Wyatt that lived down mm -hmm. on Pennsylvania. She and I, I think, walked up town. Well, that's when you were older. When we were little, Mama would call Charlie Sinclair the taxi cab man. I remember him. And yeah. he would come to the house, <laughs> and it was Kay and me and Dale. I don't remember Randy coming. My mom has had a house full of babies and bring us to the gym theater on Saturday afternoons and we for the Saturday matinee. Yeah. And Betty, that was a big deal because mom and daddy didn't let us out of their sight much. And so we, we were like, we're free, we're free at last, you know. And Charlie would come back at the end of the matinee and pick us up and take us back home. And we were probably seven, eight, nine, something like that maybe. I don't remember it, but I'm sure well, it happened. Mm -hmm. So if that was on Saturday afternoon, where was my mom and papa? At home. But well, uh -huh. daddy was always racing. He was always racing. racing. I daddy figured he was gone. racing. Yeah, he was gone a lot. Mama okay. had us. During that time, she daddy threatened was, us. During that time, yeah. daddy was racing six, seven <laughs> days a week. I mean, you know, he'd come home after a race, get his car ready and leave again in the afternoon, be gone again. Yeah. I and remember. Saturdays, he was gone to racing. Thursday was, night was Columbia. And then Saturday night was Greenville, Greenville. Pickens, mm -hmm. Speedway. Yep. Because I remember when I got old enough to drive, I remember getting to drive 
home, actually, or part of the way. Mm -hmm. I remember getting to drive home from one of those races. I don't remember which one it was. Yeah. In the tow truck? No. We or just in car. Tour, okay. Be in oh, okay. Car. Yeah. All right. That's the yeah. In the truck pulling the race car. Cool. Yeah. Well, you know, back well, in the day, mother pulled. They pulled the race car with that green Osmobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, green was the green right. Osmobile yep. that mm -hmm. was a very unlucky yep. color. Yep, Dad hated green and peanuts. The day Mama bought Daddy a new pair of shoes to race in. Back then, he drove in slip-on canvas shoes. Yeah, and they were canvas. And they were black. And Daddy said, I'm not wearing them damn green shoes. And Mama <laughs> said, Ralph, those green shoes aren't green. Well, they had flowers in the... No, in, they had little tiny little stripes. Stripes, and they had a green stripe One in the insole. One of them was a green stripe. And he would not wear them. She had to take them back. <laughs> wow. No, they had really big superstition. Uh, yeah, but he pulled with a green Osmobile. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'd love to have Memo here. I would too. Because this place is special to her. Yeah. But every time we'd ride of, by when we'd go to lunch yeah. or something, but, we'd ride uptown and she'd say, Let's stop. And if anybody was here, she'd say, Do you know who I am? Yep. So two yep. guys just walked through and I said, Kay, you want to go around and do like Mama you know did and say, Do you know who no, you we didn't. are? <laughs> did you? No, no, we didn't. What? no. No. But Mama would have. Memo you was know disappointed. Who I am? I'm his mama. Uh, yeah, I told a story about yeah, so Mamma coming up here, but um, yeah. I thought it'd be the well, same to be y'all too. Friends that way. Yeah, some um, people stayed friends and would come back and see her. Yeah, there's a lot of stories of Mamma just letting anybody in the house. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> I was one of those people. He's one of them. Yes, he's one of them. Yes, he's one of them. Hey, you want to hear my story with yes. that? <laughs> this was 2015. I had just come here just to like go to the RCR Museum, basically from Pennsylvania. Going on E5, I see the sign for Kannapolis, and I think, that's where Dale Earnhardt's from. I just took the exit. And I was like, going to drive around and see this stuff, same stuff we're looking at now. And we drove by the house, and I saw the stone three in the front yard, and I just thought, oh, you know, whoever lives there must, you know, know that that's where Dale grew up. I never would have thought that his mom would have still been there. So, and me and my friend, we go to the Waffle House down across 85, and I pull out my phone, and I'm reading about stuff, and I find out that she's still lives there and she's the same age as my grandma and I also saw the stuff about her liking to talk to people about Dale and my friend that was with me was like no man we can't bother her we don't want to do that and I'm like dude she's the same age as my grandma my grandma sits inside all day watches TV and will talk to anybody about anything and loves it <laughs> we should go there and just see if she wants to talk she might like it so we did we go up he didn't want to get out of the truck we were in that Escalade, by the oh, way, yeah. before it was a race car. We got out, rang the doorbell. She was on the phone, and she opens the door and kind of puts the phone down. She's like, can I help you boys? And I'm like, yeah, we uh, we heard you like talking to people about Dale, so we wanted to stop by and see if you were home. And she was just like, I don't know if this is a real phone call or what. She just took the phone and goes, Hangs up. She's like, what do you boys want to know? That's, sure. That's what she did. There's memo. I called her from work one time, and I, I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm talking to this nice young man. I said, Mother, we told you not to let people in the house. She said, we're not in the house. We're sitting on the front porch. Yeah. Easy access. She had her, she had her well, we're fortunate that you know, the right people yeah. always showed up. She, she said, said, race fans aren't going to hurt me. True. She said, they're all good people. All good people. That's yeah. what she always yeah. said. They're yeah. all good people. She was a charm, for sure. Yeah. You know, when Dale first was killed at first, it hurt her for people to always say, you know, that was the most devastating day of my life. And she said, well, how do they think I feel? I was his mother. But then over time... It made her feel good that that many people love Dale. She said just the fact that that many people love my son, that's when she started sharing stories and wanting to hear stories about Dale because that brought her comfort. Mm -hmm. But after a, you know, a period of time, at first it was hurtful, but I, I think that's she would not, normal. when they would show clips on TV, she wouldn't, she wouldn't watch that. Yeah, she she did not want to see him talking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard even now for, I mean, there's so much. and. It's good for his kids, his grandkids, his great grandkids, because they will always know what he sounds like, what he looks like, how he walked, how he talked, you know, how he moved. And that's not, everybody doesn't have that, you know, for their legacy, so mm. to speak. But um, yeah. he does. Well, I've told him the story about how I first met dad. I, all my, you know, I took him to all the schools I went to, and the stories about the first time that Sherry 
Earnhardt lined everything up for me to talk to him on the phone one night and uh, went over there that evening. We sat there and talked on the phone for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And then, you know, I got a Christmas gift that following Christmas from Santa. Mm -hmm. It was a racetrack mm -hmm. and um, with the race cars. And of course, you know, my dad, Jack, yeah. didn't want anything to do with this, me knowing right. anything or having any connection with him. And so- he scared he'd lose you. I, I guess I don't really know. I never, I never asked. Whatever. I never yeah. asked. Um, but um, I told him about the time I met my ma the first time at the ballpark, the ballpark where I played yeah. ball. When uh, told him that whole story, and I've been trying to remember the story of the first time we met. I got a memory. We used to go roller skating at the skating yeah. rink. Do you remember that? Did you ever go roller skating? Yeah. Okay. The one over behind Pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We were there, with me and the kids. I don't know if Pam was with us, because we used to take our kids, Brad and Mark and Ashlyn and Jennifer, and uh, you were there, and we talked, and I told you who I was, and there was one or two times that we did interact when you were little. Hmm. Now, I don't remember how old you were. You couldn't have been more than probably 10, it may be younger, really? I don't remember. But we did, See, I don't remember that. I know. I know you didn't. That I time you did the pod podcast with Dale. Yep. I, I said, I told that. Dale, I said, I got other memories. And he said, well, you want to be on the podcast? I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I remember Mamma. I remember I playing ball. And after the game, I was going out to the car. And this mm -hmm. woman and two girls were sitting there and just watched me. And finally, Mamma come up one time after the game and says, hey, Carrie, I'm your Mamma Earnhardt. And this is your cousin, Jennifer Nashley. And I was like. That, and I didn't know about dad before this. Yeah. This is the first time I learned about my real life, mm -hmm. how my life was. About your blood, Ken. Yes. <laughs> Dale came to the nursery one time and talked to me, and he said, Carrie, uh, Jackie is wanting to adopt Carrie. And he said, what should I do? I said, Dale, I hate for you. To, I mean, I just told him my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I know that's your decision. And I think he thought he couldn't pay at the time he was not Dale's. Right, 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 right. He yeah. wasn't worried. Financially, right, right. he was not able. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he did, you know, let, right. let Jackie adopt you then. But I know mother did her best any time that uh, Latane would let her see you. I mean, she could come and see you, but Dale couldn't. Mm -hmm. But I know Mother came to see you when you were little. You wouldn't remember right, it when right. you were. And I remember very that young. one Christmas when she took a Christmas gift and they wouldn't let her see you. I think you were older then, mm -hmm. and she was devastated. Yeah. And after that, that you know she couldn't see you anymore. Right. I, I guess it was about your age, and they were afraid about you having questions. Right. And, but I tell you, when Latane left Dale, he was never the same person. Mm -hmm. it, it changed him. Um, it changed his whole personality. He was because Dale was a good dad and provider. He worked right. every day. But mm -hmm. Latane was on the second shift, and he would bring you over to Mama's and Daddy's, and Mama would play with you know, take care of you as a baby, and he'd go out in the shop with Daddy and work on race cars. Well, Latane did not like that. She did not like that at all. Mm -hmm. And whatever their reason for left leaving him, I don't know, but it devastated right. changed his life well I, I never like resented anything or, or questioned why and I never knew yes. what all transpired I don't I don't know so I'm envisioning that they were high school they sweethearts were and, 16. and maybe got pregnant yes 16. and then got married mm -hmm. yes so mm -hmm. see um, how, how long were they married you were a year old. I was a year old. Mm -hmm. When they separated. Okay. So, or when she and we always so, just said they were too young. So maybe they, they wasn't even a year married? Not really. Because she was pregnant. She was pregnant, so they probably wasn't married. Maybe a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Like that. At the most, yeah. And I know I've seen a picture of Papa hold me when I was about two years old, two and a half years My old. My daddy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I, I don't know where it was at, but I, I know, know and I don't know where the picture's at now, but yeah. Mama had it. And showed it And to the me. two people that, sadly, that could tell the whole story, I know. They, you know, passed. Yep. 
it's sad that mm -hmm. you know they yeah. they're the only yep. two that know the whole real stories mm -hmm. their story to tell That's and it's right. hard to tell because you know i was living my life you were living your life mm -hmm. and she i remember bits and pieces she remembers yeah. bits and pieces now i'm kind of wanting to know more yeah um and and like and the sad part like is sherry's me. gone and danny's yep. gone the two and other they knew more they knew a lot more they knew more than anybody because yeah. mama and sherry were friends they and yes. see, that's hung out together quite hooked up because sherry lived right beside Latane and Melita and all those. Right. So they lived side by yep. side, and so they were friends growing, growing up. up. Growing up, yep. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Sherry was the one that hooked up the phone call, right? Because she was close friends. Well, I know we we did Malita. some things with Sherry and Danny, and I didn't even know. I just thought they were friends. I didn't mm -hmm. know they were family. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. Until after I met Mama at the yeah. ballpark. That's the hard part. Is all the ones that know are gone. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because, like, with me, I had a girl I dated. And we got pregnant, and I thought marriage is the best thing to do That's and support your family. Raised and and yeah. not quite three years, we're, I leave. Divorced. I walk out. Which so, was the best thing. Yeah, because it he wasn't right. He said it wasn't going to work. Yeah, it wasn't going to work. And, you know, hindsight, listen to Dad. I wish he would have sent me that military school he threatened to send me to at that time. <laughs> 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 but I got two great kids out of it. I got Bobby and Jeffrey, so, so yeah, it's a good, good thing. Right, boys. I just think it's interesting how... A lot of my life is similar to his, and it's just coincident. It ain't the, it's because you know he's my father. It just happens that way, but it, it does kind of connect. It does. I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Him and Daddy were a lot alike that way. They could, they knew people better than most. They could foresee people's personalities somehow. Yeah. And or they other. were very similar very. in the fact that. They had few words to say, and mm -hmm. and when they were done saying it, they were done. They were done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as far as Canapolis and uh, and the uh, workings of Canapolis, my mother, you know, she worked at the Donut Dinette. She worked at Nita's, and when we were little, we didn't have a lot of real interaction with Canapolis other than what we said coming to Woolworths and going to the gym theater. But as mother started working in those places, she really developed a lot of relationships yeah. with people and the infrastructure of Canapolis. Especially the Donut Dinette. It's, especially mm -hmm. the Donut Dinette. But then at Nita's, some of them, everybody that had new babies come there to buy their right. babies christening gowns or baby clothes or a baby gift. And, and I'll meet people even today that'll say, oh, I just met your mom was so precious. You know, I bought my baby's first dress at Nita's, and I didn't know who she was. And wow. she was the most gracious person, you know. Growing up, Mama had boom, 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 five kids, and she never had to work. Right. Daddy provided and raised five kids racing and left her debt-free, home paid for money in the bank when he died young at 44, 45 years he was, old. He 40, was 45. 45. And, um, you know, so she never had to work. Right. Now, and mother so, went to work at Aunt Ruth's greenhouse. Well, she did work at Aunt Ruth's, but, but that was for a little spending money. It's because oh. <laughs> she wanted a washer and a dryer. Oh. Yep. We had a ringer washer on the back porch. Wow. And I a remember her rolling washer. her my, arm in it one time I and have she rolled it her my, arm back out. And I have it at my <laughs> house. Ouch. You got it? <laughs> I do. I got it yeah. my house. Oh, wow. Because yeah. Daddy wouldn't buy anything on credit. You had to pay, pay for cash. It. That's smart. We never, he never. I wish we lived by that today. Mother never picked it out either. Oh, really? He, he would not. go and mm -hmm. buy a bedroom suit, bring it home, and it'd be there when a she car, got home. He bought it. She had to be time. happy with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That blue so, tow truck that that they found Sonny and yeah, Dale yeah. Jr.'s got, bought it with cash. Bought it with cash. Mm -hmm. So I know whenever I started coming around the family, Mama worked at Nita's, mm -hmm. yeah. and she worked there the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, until she retired. Until she, mm -hmm. re yeah. And that's all I knew. I didn't know about that donut. What the donut, donut, donut Dinette. Donut Dinette. Donut Dinette. Donut Dinette. I never knew about that one. Yep. So in Mama's house now, how old were y'all when y'all moved in there? Six. She was six. You were six. Well, or seven, maybe. No, you were in the first grade because I cried. I so started you the first grade, mm -hmm. but I had to start oh. when I was almost seven. That's true. Because of my birthday is in October. And I cried because I wanted to go to school. I cried because I didn't want to go. Yeah. And she <laughs> cried because I didn't want to go. Oh, yeah. that's I silly. remember my first whooping. We still lived down in the apartment. And for some reason, she got to go up to grandma's and they wouldn't let me go. And so I hid in the closet and mom and daddy was in the kitchen and I got mama's red high heels and I snuck out of the house. 
and I went up and the boss live on the corner and here I went clomping in them red high hills. I'm going to grandma's, you know. I was a Billy Badass, you know, going to grandma's. And so I heard daddy coming and I hid in the wardrobe. I said, Grandma, please don't tell him I'm here. Well, I can't lie to your daddy, Kathy. And he switched me till I wet my pants and switched oh, wow. me all the way home. And I never run away again. And you know, I remember every whipping he gave me and, and while it was for, and that was it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I noticed. And we Tim, didn't consider it child abuse. No, no we I didn't remember having to go pick abuse. out my own switch. I never considered getting beaten to child abuse. I mean, I had uh -huh. whelps on my back we and my were butt. All better behaved. Yes. Yes. It taught well, us we learned, respect. Well, we learned. We learned. Nowadays, they don't. They taught no. us respect. They want respect. Uh huh. They well, did. I know one time when I was a, I was a cheerleader, and I was maybe seventh grade. Oh, I won't never forget this. And uh, my grades were really bad, and Daddy would and not. And she's a let... straight A student now. No, I yes, wasn't. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Yes, I made you were. decent grades, yes, but you were. I had a failing grade <laughs> in something, and he would not let me go to the ball game to the mm -hmm. dance, to anything. It I could go to school, right. and that was mm -hmm. it. You better believe yeah. my grades were better mm -hmm. the next. Oh yeah. Six weeks. That's the way I was. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go play with my he buddies or anything. Strict. And he stood by the rules. Yeah. If he told you something, yep. you didn't say, but why not? Or, but daddy, or please. We'd beg mother all day, but daddy, you asked once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just knew the town meant so much, Mamma, and it meant a lot to me because I, you know, I grew up cruising here and oh, you know, coming up say here that shopping. When me and my friend Kay Smith, Kay Keener, yeah. she had a GTO. And, mm. uh, We'd come and cruise through every now and then, but it wasn't our regular hangout. Right. Our regular hangout was Whataburger Number no. Five. That's not there anymore. Over there, right there, where Walgreens is on the corner, it was yes. up a little bit okay. yeah. before that. Yeah. But um, or we'd go down to um, right across from the hospital. In Concord. Martin's Drive. Martin's Drive in, which they moved it. Which down. was the Concord people. Yeah. Right. So we hung out kind of with both. That's what I did. You know, I, I did the same thing. Yeah, I, I remember. The ceremony with this. Sam Bass mm -hmm. and I were on the committee to choose the sculptor, uh, Clyde Ross Morgan, great man. Um, a lot of the details, you know, we chose on the committee. Of course, Teresa had the final say right. and what was done, but a very emotional, very emotional time. I remember him coming to Mother's house mm -hmm. and Danny had kind of the same body structure as Dale. Mm -hmm. I remember the ceremony going on with the statue and you, like I said, you was involved with the board and everything and how much, how special it was to Mamaw. Mm -hmm. um, it was special to a lot of us, but Mamaw was very emotional the that day. Person, yes. um, and you know, I know you talked about the guy you worked with in Arizona and how it was delivered with fans and all, that's pretty neat. But let's go look and see what the statue is really. Okay. So you said it came in pieces? Like it was in pieces they put together, you remember? No, I don't know. Only one well, piece. That's one piece. This was in pieces. The base, oh, okay. The was it was off. laying on a trailer strapped down. Mm -hmm. It was laying on a trailer. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think whenever we done the ceremony, we all sat over there, right? Wasn't we all sitting over there? We were all over here. Oh, uh, I, think, I think we were over there. Cause it seemed like I remember us facing Main Street. I got street pictures at home. <laughs> We did face Main Street. I think we did. Yeah, we did face Main Street. And I think it's pretty cool because they've got everything. We faced Main Street. A, I think there was fans and other people here. Right. Kind of in a we were kind of in a category. Yes. Like yes. yes. Okay. I remember yeah. that day was pretty neat. And that was they had had not built this wall yet. Had no. They? No. 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 The park wasn't built at all. I don't even yeah. think the bricks were here. I think it was just no, no, just no, this. Right. You're just right. The granite yep. and the statue. That was yeah. an an amazing job. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. It's him. And what we wrote in our handwriting was by him. Well, see, I didn't know about all this. I wonder why I didn't do nothing like that. Oh, up there. Oh, yeah. We love you and miss you. Always be in our hearts wherever you're found. That is cool. See, I didn't know about that until now. And then Clyde Ross did that sculpture by Oh, wow. He was about this tall in life. He seemed like it. Yeah, you always looking up to him. I always seemed like it. Yep. He was really just about our height. But no, he was, he was a little taller. taller than me. He was six foot. Well, everybody's taller than you. He's six he one. Was, how tall are you? I'm six one. He the was same, about his height. I'm the same height. He just barely your height, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he seemed bigger than life. He did. 
his stature made him seem bigger. Yep. And he was, from the day he was born, he was large and in charge. Well, I'm gonna say it, like we talked earlier, the lining in that casket's wore out from him rolling well, over. Rolling over. <laughs> with stuff grave. happening oh, in the world Lord, today. I can't believe it. And yeah. family and racing and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bicycle races at home back in the day. Yep. Won those. Yep. Yeah. Imagine what it would be like we today. We took my bike apart. We didn't get a, anything with wheels on it that he didn't take apart, whether it was a wagon, a tricycle, or a bicycle. Well, was he souping it up or what? Was yeah. He, he working yeah. on it to make it faster. Taking fenders off of it. See, we yeah. never got, everybody didn't get one. We got one to share. Oh, okay. We had and Rosemary's so, bike. Yeah. yeah. And so Dale always took things apart and made them his. I remember him riding a bicycle, <laughs> sitting on the handlebars. Oh yeah. Riding it backwards. That was uh, on He's sitting on the handlebars and pedaling it. He did that on Chubb Key when I was traveling with them. Oh. I got a picture of him doing That's that. Cool. He just loved to adventure. Yeah. And he wanted to race. Yeah. And that was the, that was part of the problem with his marriages. Right. He wanted well, to racing think, came first. I think he accomplished Until all that. Until he realized that wasn't most important. It was a little bit. Yeah. You know that what three days before he was killed, he told Daryl Walter, Daryl, I've got it exactly. all. Exactly, he did. He did. I've got he it did. all. And and <laughs> I grew up as a family. You hug and love each other, yeah. and yeah. you were. Yeah. I was never. And he did too. Yeah, but he never said it. No, he, he never, never said hugged. It. But our daddy he was, didn't. He was not a big hugger. Up to that mm -hmm. weekend, he did. And I have to share that I did get a few hugs because I was traveling with them. All right, yeah. She was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, but me, daddy wasn't a hugger. No. I don't remember daddy mm -hmm. hugging and saying, mm -hmm. I love no. you. Or and I, mean, I remember, you know, I raced at Daytona in the, the Dash Series that Friday. And then that Saturday morning, I left to come home and I told him bye. And he gave me a hug and told me he loved me. And, Tell me bye. It was like the third time he's done that. Mm -hmm. And then and he did. that happened. He and he meant it when he did it. Yeah. yeah. He didn't say things and, he didn't and, mean. But I mean, I, I felt him getting more personal and, and more right. involved. involved in wanting to be involved. Mm -hmm. If he had just had a little more time. Yeah. That's not God's plan. Well, none of us are promised tomorrow. So last year, Kay and I left for the beach the day after that, but it was in June. June, yep. yeah. This year's in August. I don't, that's a little no, hot. Yeah, it's it is hot. a little hot. We'll figure, out we'll figure it out. Well, I love you, Carrie Dale. I love you more. As Mama always said. <laughs> I'm just happy to be I'm happy to involved. be. Yeah. We're happy get, get here. to have our time together. Absolutely. Uh -huh. A little bit that we have. That's all we have. So we niche here a little bit here or there. That's all can we, we can do. Can we take a picture? Yeah. Oh, please. Take a cute picture. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt the moment when you were standing there. Your feet and your knees were exactly like the statue. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. 100%. Relationship with Dad back when Dad first started racing, and I'll let them kind of tell you the story because I wasn't around them, but um, I understood there was a connection made between someone higher up in either Charlotte Motor Speedway or NASCAR that connected this guy with my dad. Turn left. And then the destination sorry. is on your right. <laughs> Turn that thing off. And they joined together. And I'll let him tell you the story because it's an interesting story about the car and the color of the car and all that. Was it Humpy Wheeler? I don't know if it's Humpy. I don't think it was Humpy. I gotta find this guy first. And I'm not handicapped, so I can't park there. <laughs> not, I mean, physically I ain't, but mentally I might be. This looks good to me. But what I, what I understood is like Les, I think it was Les Rick, Richard and Bill, Bill France, when dad in 1979 maybe, dad was gonna run a limited schedule and he talked Mike into sponsoring dad. It's the story I heard. And then dad went on to 1980 winning the championship. Yep, is that so right? won the championship. Yeah, so I, that's I wasn't around at the, all this time. Yeah, that was um, who Bill won the championship with. Right. Uh, just, I just, on the I got just picking up the stories. The um, Mike wasn't the owner of the car. He was the sponsor. Well, he owned it. And sponsored it too? Okay. Because he bought it from Austin. Okay. Now, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I've never seen one of these particular ones up close before.
That's probably just like a little hammer, dolly hammer to beat it out yeah. instead yeah. of a roller now. You just make oh, all those wild. panels mm -hmm. fill in the factory bumper and stuff. Yeah. And just rivet it through the bumper. And see, they had to cut the bumper to make it shorter. Short, and yep. they welded it back and then chrome it. That is unreal. Was that the Oldsmobile had a more aerodynamic nose than the Chevy did? Yeah. So. For, for a speedway. It's amazing. Looking back at stuff, how they did, like, all the fabbing and everything. You ever wish that you could have been around to drive the cars of this era? Um, I, it would have been interesting, I think. <laughs> uh, it would have been a lot different, for sure. It had been cool to actually try it out. Did he just keep this car the whole time? Did he like, sell it and have to find it again? No, we, we had kept it the whole time. Wow. Yeah. We've got and, three of these. Uh, we got this Oldsmobile here. We got two Chevrolets. One, like I said, is on the trailer. And the other one's at Mike's house in Nashville, Tennessee. That's cool. Yeah, that. A little lame. Gosh. <laughs> oh, that thing's thick, too. Yeah. Imagine wearing that in oh. um, Talladega, 100 degrees outside all day. It'd be hot. It's a large. <laughs> the large kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool, though. And them barrels, we got all kind of race uniforms in them. Indy, a lot of, a lot of the Indy race uniforms. And Michael, big in Indy cars. And, and another main reason I wanted to come out here, because I know after your know, dad's passing and everything, you know, my mama, she, she was very passionate about Kannapolis she and, show and up. you know what, for someone to get in contact with Mamaw to have her to come up and sign autographs had to be very special for yeah, her. It was unreal. She was um, the nicest person. I mean, she, she really looked forward to coming in here. Yeah. I mean, she, I know she's told me about times that she was coming in, she'd come in and sign, said there was a big bus of people come oh, in yes. from different places. All over, and, all over everywhere. And said that she'd come in here and sign, sell, sell her cookbooks, mm -hmm. like sell, she was talking sell earlier. Cookbooks. And, um, dang, her and uh, Jeff Gordon's mom done the cookbooks. I don't know why I can't remember her name all of a sudden, but that was a pretty special time for Mamaw. She liked, she liked what all was involved with that. She was proud of her cookbook and yep. proud of wanting to be somewhere to sign autographs. And I don't know, I can't remember. Carol, that's it. I can't Carol. remember how old she was when she started. It's ever up till she couldn't go no more. Yeah. She drove over here every time. Oh yeah. She'd drive that car right over here and yep. we'd go out there and get her and help her bring the books in, help her uh, you know, get set up yep. and everything. And get her, I'd get her a bottle of water and put it on the table. And I'd sit down there and talk to her. Yeah, so and she'd tell all kinds of stories about And that's about the table she said at, right? Yep. Sit right here so people could come around this way and they'd come up and line up. There'd be people lined up all the way out the back door. Oh, wow. Signing autographs. That's pretty neat. And, uh, but. I went to lunch with her quite often. And I know one time she drove, one of the first times we went together, she drove. And ever since after that one time I drove, because she scared the living <laughs> pee out of me. <laughs> she was a well, lead always, foot. We she, always asked her, said, you want us to come get you, we'll come get you. Yep. She said, nope, I'm driving. I said, okay. Yep. And then after that, so I started taking her driving to lunch. Yep. I'd pick her up and drive, and uh, I hear stories that her and a group of girls would get together and go to the beach, and she would always drive. Yep. She wouldn't let nobody drive. And they'd go to and, the townhouse restaurant and eat breakfast. Yep, and said that she she would always get there like 40 minutes earlier than what the rest of them would, because mm -hmm. <laughs> she was so fast. <laughs> well, if you'd tell her, if, if, if Roger would line up a tour, say he'd be here at 1 o'clock, she'd be here at 1230. Really? Yes. Getting ready and set getting up. Getting ready, I mean, just happy as a lark, just getting ready. And uh, I'd go get her some felt pens and and uh, some sharpies. And she had this uh, she had this brochure. It was uh, I think it was something like the Dale Trail. She had yep, one time. Yep. And she'd sign those. She'd sign anything. anything. People would bring stuff in. Uh, the only thing I never saw in was a hood. Oh really? A hood of a of a car. I'm surprised. They I'm, never. They, I don't think they get it on the bus. They probably get get on the bus. Yeah. Though. But uh, yeah, we would come in and uh, you know and sign cars. They'd sign hats. They'd sign shirts. All kind. Of, I mean, she'd sign everything. And what what was good about her was 
when she'd get through signing them, they'd ask her, say, could we have a picture with you? And she'd stand right here in front of this car mm. and get a picture of me. Really? Yep. She'd that's get neat. up. Well, I know we, we met with Aunt Kathy and Kay earlier, and that's, you know, one thing they touched on is how she would, she never met a stranger. Mm -hmm. She always, you know, they, they would always fuss her about letting just anybody in the house. And she's like, these people are good people. They're yeah. race fans. Well, that's, that's why I was telling you a while ago about the people that would come down, I think they were from Michigan. And they came down and toured the Curb Museum here. Yeah. And uh, uh, she said, we came down to buy a cookbook. And I said, well, ma'am, I don't have any cookbooks here. Uh, I said, uh, Martha always brings them with her. We go out and unload them out of her car and brings them in when she signs autographs. And uh, she said, well, I want to buy one. And I said, okay, hold on a minute. So I went to the office and I called her up and asked her, I said, These, we got some people from Michigan wanting to buy a cookbook. And I said, would it be all right for me to come over and get one? And she says, no, bring them over here. <laughs> <laughs> Not come to get one, just Don't bring them with you. She said, bring them with you. Oh, that's my mom. She said, have them follow you and come over here. And she said, I'll sign it and everything right in front of oh, them. Oh, wow. And I said, okay. So uh, I took her up. I took them over and she she didn't stop once. She was meeting us at the door. Yeah. And had the door open and she says, come on in. And they yeah. went in there and sat down in that, the that's... living room, in that big room in the front. And that's where they sat for yeah. 20 minutes. And that, she, was, yeah, that was my mom. Yes, her. That was yeah. her. Well, I don't want to take up much of your time. I just wanted oh, to come by and me, yeah. get this story because I know Mamma always talked a lot about Mike Curb and Curb Racing yep. and a lot of stuff she'd done and you know how Mike, she enjoyed Mike thinking about her and helping her out too. Yes. Uh, I'm glad you came I appreciate by. it. Yes, I appreciate sir. it. Thank you, Gene. Come on by anytime. All right. Oh, speaking of, if you're ever in the area, you've got to get by Curb Motorsports. It's not just all motorsports. They have the North Carolina Hall of Fame Museum uh, for music mus musicians. Yeah. Um, every, everybody, every, anybody that's uh, from North Carolina. Anybody from North Carolina. We do an induction ceremony every October. Oh wow! Anywhere between Ronnie Millsap, Charlie, uh, Charlie Daniels, all kind. Of, it's all kind of stuff. Yeah, that's pretty neat. For North Carolina. I know you showed us a car, Leon, Leon Ryan's Leon first Ryan's car. Ryan's car here. A Viper. A first car is a Viper. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow! Yep. I mean, I think my first car was a Volkswagen. No. <laughs> mine was a pickup truck. Mine was a '65 Impala. I wish I had it back. I wish I had my Impala back. If I knew back then what I know now, I'd still have it. But I ended up with the '70 and the '72 Chevelle. So, another show for another time. Yep. Speaking of another show for another time, I appreciate y'all joining us, and uh, maybe we'll see you down the road about my racing career. Hope so. You gotta leave a comment if you want to see that. Blow it up down there. Yeah, blow it, please. <laughs>
you can find the same format hometown history tour video that we've also done with Mark Martin and Kenny Wallace in their respective hometowns. So go to the channel page, check that out, and uh, try to remember something from this. Learn something. There's lots of cool stuff there.